My name is Nicholas Erf. I was born in 1927, the only child of middle-class parents who died when I was still in my teens. I wasted two years doing my national service, then went to Oxford where I got a third-class degree and a first-class illusion that I was a poet. Like countless Oxford men before me, I turned to teaching. But in a minor public school in East Anglia, I quickly discovered I could not spend my life crossing such a Sahara. And the more I felt it, the more I felt also that the smug, petrified school was a toy model of England itself, and that to quit one and not the other would be ridiculous. I knew what I needed, a new land, a new race, a new language, and although I couldn't have put it into words then, I needed, above all, a new mystery. I'm afraid all the really good posts are gone, Mr. Earth. Oh. At the moment, there's only this. The Lord Byron School Fraxus requires an assistant master to teach English. The school is terribly well spoken of, though some people find Greece rather backward. Backward sounds ideal to me. I'll take it. Oh, I'll make the necessary overtures. Wonderful. Perhaps I could take you out to lunch to celebrate, Miss Spencer Hay. Oh, <laughs> do call me Rowena. I suppose I'd had, by the standards of 1953, a good deal of sex for my age. I was handsome enough, and more important, I had my orphan air of loneliness, which, as every womanizer knows, is a deadly weapon. I took Rowena to lunch, flirted amiably, and then, when I got home, I filled in the application form she gave me and went straight out to post it. That same evening, by a curious neatness of fate, I met Alison. Hi. Could you ask Maggie to come out? Uh, oh, don't worry, I can see her. Maggie? Mags? Alison! You said next week. I ran out of money. Look, I must have a bath. Sorry, darling, no go. It's stacked with beer. Oh, God. Use mine, upstairs. Oh, Alison, this is Nicholas, our upstairs neighbour. Would you mind? I've just come from Paris. I must look disgusting, and I'm pretty sure I smell. No problem. Take the key. I'll be up in a minute to make sure you're OK. You're an angel. Another nice English girl, anxious to meet you, Nick. I'll just see to Alison. Oh, listen, she's engaged to my brother. Just stay clear, OK? She's been a bit mixed up, confused. Ali's a great girl, but she makes mistakes. I'll just clean the spiders out of the bath. Have a drink. There's whiskey on the side. You're a lifesaver. Did Margaret warn you off me? A bit. She said you were engaged. Pete and I aren't like that. Free people, you know? She hasn't frightened you off. I'm still here. Brave man. I'll get that whiskey then. Are you joining me? In the whiskey, I mean, not the bath. <laughs> Why not? So where have you been? France, Spain, all over. I've applied for a job as an air hostess. Thought I should polish the languages a bit. Do I pass? You look fantastic. <laughs> You're only being nice, but thanks. I mean it. Should we go down then? Just one more finger of whiskey and I'll be ready. Cheers, then. Can I take you out tomorrow? <laughs> You're quick. I don't like Englishmen. They're all snobs and prigs. You're the first Australian girl I've met. Just nice English girls. They weren't all so nice, in the sense you mean. I don't know what I mean. I'm drunk and flirting with a stranger. I want to kiss you. I know you do. You've got a nice mouth. That. <laughs> All right. Kiss me. Coffee. Oh, Jesus. I was hoping you were a dream. Please don't look at me. Do you know how many men I've slept with the last two months? Fifty. If it was that many, I'd just be an honest professional. God, I was tired. And so drunk. Thanks very much. I'm sorry, you're nice. It... Only, you know what it's like waking up with a man you didn't know this time yesterday? 
it's losing something of yourself. Do you think I'm a tramp? I like you, Alison. Very much. Wow, talk about avoiding the question. You do. I can see it in your eyes. I don't care. Just hold me, will you, Nick? Please? Oh, God. Why are you crying? Doesn't matter. Just hold me. Later that day, she went downstairs to face Maggie, then came back to me with red eyes and a suitcase full of her stuff. Alison wasn't beautiful exactly, but her sum was extraordinarily more than her parts. I could never predict what she would do or say. She was different from any girl I'd met before. One day when we were out driving, I was using my favourite metaphor, the cage of glass between me and the rest of the world. But Alison just laughed. Poor lonely Nick. You say you're isolated, but really, you just think you're special. My parents are dead. I've no brothers or sisters, no friends I care about. Then don't be alone. Marry someone. Marry me. Except you never would because I'm a whore and a colonial. I wish you wouldn't use that word. Sorry. Australian. (laughs) As she looked across at me and took my hand, I suddenly had a feeling that if she disappeared, I'd lose half of myself. It was a terrible, death-like fear, which anyone less self-absorbed than I was would have realised was simply love. Instead, stupidly, I thought it was desire. I drove her straight home and tore her clothes off. I had a letter today to the school in Fraxos. They want me to start in October. I don't have to accept it. Let's not do this again. We've been over it. All right. Would you marry me if I asked you? You can't say it like that. I'd marry you tomorrow if I thought you really needed me. Nico, don't. It's just I've got to get out of this country. And you've got your air hostess job. Some of their flights go to Athens. We could meet there. Nico, ask me to marry you. Will you marry me? No. So now you're free. (sighs) And you're free too? Yeah, I'm free too if it makes you happier. So there it is, mate. We're decided. Well, that's what you really want. I don't want to hurt you. And the more I want you, the more I shall. And I don't want you to hurt me. But the more you don't want me, the more you will. Alison? No more now, Nick. It's done. Waiter! Two gin and its. My shout, Mitford. It's good to meet my predecessor at the Lord Byron. Mm, Happy to pass on the lie of the land, dear chap. I was wondering why you left. Ah, Writing a book. Wartime experiences, time with the gorillas, Paddy Lee Firmer and I type of thing. The school is the best in Greece, but a word to the wise. Treat the boys tough. It's the only way. Fellow before me, name of Le Verrier, decent sort by all accounts, but too soft. Couldn't control them. Got very pally with this local collaborator chappy, which didn't exactly endear him to the locals. Left under the proverbial. Collaborator? Hmm. Name of conscious. Tell the truth, he and I had a bit of a row. Told him what I thought of him. Well, other than that, the island is pretty dull, unless you like the birds and the bees type of thing. You're not exactly selling the place to me. <laughs> oh, you'll find your feet, I expect. Make something of it. There's just one thing, though. Beware of the waiting room. The what? I questioned him, but he only smiled like the Cheshire cat. The waiting room? What waiting room? It went round and round in my head all that evening. My last before leaving for Greece. What if I said I'd wait for you? Suppose I said yes, wait, in a year's time we'll know. All the time you'll be waiting with no guarantee. I could do it if I thought there was a chance. We have to be free. We haven't got a choice. I know what it's like when people go away. It's agony for a week or two, then painful. Then you forget, like it never happened. As if you haven't lost something forever. We've got to go on living, however sad it is. I don't think you know what sadness is. In what seemed like a moment, we were standing at the door the next morning. She kissed me, desperately, clumsily, so swiftly I hardly felt it. And then she was gone. I went to the window and saw her walking fast across the street. She never once looked back. The thing I felt most clearly when she finally disappeared was that I had escaped. 
and more odiously that in some indefinable way I had won. The island of Fraxos lay eight dazzling hours south of Athens. It took my breath away when I first saw it, floating like a majestic black whale in an amethyst sea. Alison and I wrote to each other often throughout those first few weeks. At first, my letters were full of excuses and self-justification. But slowly, information took the place of emotion. When her final letter came, I was not surprised. Nico, I can't go on with this anymore. When you do fall in love, properly, remember the day you left and how I kissed you and walked away and never once looked back. If you could only understand, but you can't. You never will. I love you so much, and I'll hate you forever for the way I felt that day. You will always be different for me. Yours with love, Alison. What I had not expected was how bitter I would feel, and absurdly how betrayed. I wrote a letter in reply, but tore it up. If anything might hurt her, silence would. It never occurred to me to ask myself why her pain mattered so much if I didn't care for her. To begin with, there was something pleasantly absurd about teaching English in a Greek boarding school run on Eton and Harrow lines, but the boys cared nothing for literature and the routine was stultifying. I had little in common with the other masters. The only one I could tolerate was Dimitriades, known as Meli for his love of honey and that was largely because he spoke good English. So, with no company but my own boredom, I took to the hills. I would hike through the pine forest, over the central crest, to the south side of the island. Here there was absolute solitude, save for one deserted villa lost among the green froth of the pine tops. Mutsa Beach, on the eastern headland, was my favourite place to swim. As I walked on the shingle to the villa end of the cove, I suddenly had the sensation I was no longer alone. Searched the trees, there was nothing. Then a shock. On the rocks was a pair of rubber fins and a towel. A book had been left beneath, an anthology of modern English verse. It was open, and I saw immediately that a few lines had been underscored in red ink. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. I knew the poem well, Eliot's Little Giddy. Suddenly a bell sounded, three times, as though in summons. Curious, I took the cliff path up towards the villa. Then I saw it. Nailed high on the trunk of a pine, a notice in dull red letters on a white background. Patches of rusty metal showed through, but the writing was clear enough. Salle d'étente. The waiting room. Irresistibly drawn to solve the mystery, I walked on towards the villa. There were two old cane chairs on the colonnade and a table on which were two cups and saucers and two plates covered in muslin. Without warning, a figure appeared in the doorway. He was completely bald, brown as old leather, short and spare, perhaps 60, perhaps 10 years older, but the most striking thing about him was the intensity of his eyes, very dark brown and staring with a simian penetration, eyes that seemed not quite human. He saw me without surprise, raised his hand briefly, then turned and called, Maria, our guest has arrived. I only came for a glass of water. My name is... I know who you are, Mr. Earth. Mm -hmm. Let us have tea. Mm -hmm. Forgive me, Mr... Conscious. Morris Conscious. I prefer the C.H. soft. Mr. Conscious, how do you know who I am? Fraxos is a small island. A new teacher, especially of English, is always a figure of some interest. <laughs> you met my predecessor, I believe. John of Arier. The one after him, Mitford. Captain Mitford. Mm. He made me ashamed to have English blood. Do you like my house? I designed it myself. It's beautiful. I envy you. It is I who envy you, Nicholas. Your discoveries are all before you. You live alone here, Mr. Conscious. What some would call alone, what others would not. Come now. Prospero will show you his domain. Prospero had a daughter. 
Prospero had many things, Mr. Earth. Not all young and beautiful. I was wondering about the sign, Salle de Tente. A German soldiers requisitioned Barani during the war. They were bored here. The sign was their little joke. Are you elect, Mr. Earth? I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you feel chosen by anything? John Lavarie felt chosen by God. I don't believe in God, and I certainly don't feel chosen. Even so, I think you may be. Thank you. It's not a compliment. Hazard, luck, chance makes you elect. You cannot elect yourself. Now, I must rest. I have two requests. One is that you tell no one you have met me. This is because of certain things that happened in the war. I'm sure you understand. Mm. My second request is that you visit me here next weekend. I think we have many things to discover together. Nothing would give me greater pleasure. You play superbly, Mr. Conscious. <laughs> Once upon a time, perhaps. I've been admiring your pictures while you played. This is Mogdiliani, isn't it? Very fine reproduction. Oh, it's not a reproduction. Now, there are another two paintings I would like you to see. Hmm. The paintings, clearly his favourites, were nudes by Bonnard. Girls in sunlit interiors, glowing like yellow fires with vibrant life, humanity and sexuality. By the French door stood a small table on which stood a photograph in an old-fashioned silver frame. A girl in Edwardian dress stood by a vase of roses on an improbable Corinthian pedestal. She was very pretty, with a massed pile of light hair, a narrow waist, and the Gibson girl sharpness of feature that the age so admired. She's beautiful. My fiancé. She died young. She looks English. As she was. And you. Do you have someone special? There was a girl, but I'd rather not talk about it. Of course. Now, I usually take my aperitif on the terrace. I will see you there in half an hour. But before that, I must tell you something important. I am psychic. Oh. I'm afraid I'm not. Not at all. But that is not significant. Until later, then. Hmm? Mr. Conscious, mm. what did you mean when you said you were psychic? What do you think I meant? A spiritualism? Is pure infantilism, of course. You haven't answered my question. Your reaction is the characteristic one of your contrasuggestible century. To disbelieve and disprove. Look up, Nicholas. What do you see? Stars. Space. Other worlds. I have travelled to them. You mean actually travelled? In the flesh? <laughs> if you can tell me where the flesh ends and the mind begins, I will answer your question. Ah, dinner is served. There are some things that words cannot explain, Nicholas. What was that? I heard nothing. It sounded like someone running. Nicholas, I'm going to tell you something that might shock you. You too are psychic. I assure you I'm not. I've never had any sort of psychic experience in my life. And anyway, I'm an atheist. Oh, anyone of intelligence is either agnostic or atheist, just as he is a physical coward. They are automatic definitions of intelligence. But I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about science. Now we must eat. And after that, I shall tell you the story of my time in England. I first saw Lily when she was 14 and I a year older. 
We lived in St. John's Wood, in one of those small white mansions for successful merchants. One day in June, I was reading when suddenly a head appeared over the garden wall, framed in a sunlit halo of pale blonde hair. From that first moment, I was in love. We quickly grew very close. We were both musical, I on the piano and harpsichord, she on flute and recorder. Sometimes we would play duets. And in those early days, she loved me more like a brother, but even so, we promised each other we would marry as soon as she was 16. But it was 1914. Hmm. I went to Lily's house and told her I was going to volunteer. Hmm. Glass of brandy, Nicholas? I hope you're not going to stop. I will only be a moment. As he went inside, it came again, the same rapid walk. I got to the parapet just in time to see the flowing whiteness of a long dress disappear in the darkness. Everything all right, Nicholas? There was someone here. A woman, not Maria. Much younger than that. I'm being tactless. Forgive me. Not tactless. Lacking in imagination, perhaps. Yeah. Enjoy your brandy, hmm? I spent my last two days with Lily. She and I swore eternal love. A little more than six months later, I found myself posted to the front near the German positions at a village called Neuve Chapelle. You cannot imagine what the first few moments of the British bombardment were like. The heaviest ever delivered. When we came to the German trenches, everyone had been blown to pieces. The blood, the bones sticking out of flesh, the stench of burst intestines. The effect on me was not nausea or terror. It was an intense new conviction that nothing, no cause, could justify this. I have a test for you, Nicholas. I have here a dice, a shaker, a saucer and a pillbox. I'm going to explain to you why we went to war. Why mankind always goes to war. It is not countries, but men. And once one has been to war, one has had salt for the rest of one's life. Do you understand my meaning? Of course. Hmm. Well, in my perfect republic, there would be a test for all young men at the age of 21. They would go to a hospital and throw a dice. One of the six numbers would mean instant, painless death. No mess, no bestial cruelty. Just one clinical throw of the dice. And either death or the taste of salt, enough to last a lifetime. An improvement on war. In this pillbox <clears throat> are three human teeth. They look like teeth, but they are not. They are suicide pills. Hydrocyanic acid. Take the dice, Nicholas, and roll it. I offer you an entire war in one second. In a moment from now, you could be saying, I risked death, I threw for life, and I won life. It is the most wonderful feeling to have survived. But throw a six, and you must take the tooth. <laughs> Wouldn't a corpse be a bit embarrassing for you? Not at all. I could easily prove it was suicide. <laughs> You're bluffing. I think you know I'm not. I don't want to play. Then you are a fool and a coward, my friend. Very well. A six... Bite down hard, Nicholas, and it will all be over in a second. You will feel very little. No, I won't do it. Hmm. Then I shall. Harmless. Just almond oil. 
and the dice is loaded, it rolls a six every time. <laughs> mm -hmm. The decision you've just made is precisely the same as the one I took that morning 40 years ago. You have behaved exactly as any intelligent human being should. I congratulate you. The craving to risk death is humanity's last great perversion. But the dice was loaded. There was, there was no proper choice. Patriotism, propaganda, honour, esprit de corps. What are all those things but loaded dice? <laughs> Just before half past three that afternoon, we fixed bayonets to renew the assault further down the line. At the signal, we began to walk forward across a cratered field. And for a few moments, nothing happened. We began to think the Germans were all dead. It was a trap. Suddenly, machine guns started firing, scything us down like grass. A whistle sounded. A sergeant shouted at me to run forward. But I made an instant, irrevocable decision. To live. I heard a shot, dropped my rifle, staggered, then rolled into a shell crater. I was gripped by a fever, a passion to exist. I remained in my crater, unmoving, eyes closed, for a full day and night. I crawled back towards our lines on my stomach, passing the bodies of hundreds of my friends and comrades. I had no plan. But a drowning man soon learns to swim. I had a little money, and my French was fluent. A week later, I reached Boulogne. I met a soldier from the rifle brigade. He was very drunk, and I made him drunker. I stole his papers, and with my new identity, I caught the leave ship. What happened when you got home? Mm. It is late. Tomorrow. You're not ashamed to be the guest of a traitor to his country? I don't think you were a traitor to the human race. Hmm. The human race is unimportant. It is the self that must not be betrayed. Good night, Nicholas. Sleep well. When I got to my bedroom, I undressed and stood a moment by the open window. Then it came, faint at first, so barely perceptible I thought I must be imagining it. Men singing. Slowly it grew clearer until suddenly, incredibly, I recognized the tune, sung with dreamlike slowness, as if being sung out of the stars and crossing night and space to reach me. If I retained any doubt before, I knew it now. I had truly entered Prospero's domain. I admired the performance you laid on for me last night. Wonderful way to, to illustrate your story. I suppose you had loudspeakers in the trees. Very well. I won't mention it again. The last thing I want to do is offend you. I am not offended, Nicholas. And I do not ask you to believe. All I ask is that you pretend to believe. Now, you must tell me about this girlfriend of yours. She turned you down? No, the other way round. She loved me, or said she did. And do you now regret your decision? It doesn't matter. It's over. It's all too late. Why? If she still loves you, can't you return to her? You still think of her, you want to see her. You must write and tell her so. Now you're leaving it to hazard. We no more have to leave everything to luck than we have to drown in the sea. Swim, Nicholas. I suppose I don't know what love is. And I don't really care a damn about it all anymore. My dear young man. You cannot be such a pessimist about love at so tender an age. I will show you the innermost secret of life. He put down an ancient stone head. Whether of a man or of a woman, it was impossible to say. The face was set in a triumphant smile. 
a smile full of the purest metaphysical good humor. It's cyclotic, isn't it? Never mind what it is. Look into its eyes. There's something implacable in that smile. It is the truth. Truth is implacable. I wonder if it would have that smile if it knew of Belson and Auschwitz. Because so many died, we know we still live. That is the secret of the smile. That what might not be, is. When I die, I shall have this at my bedside. It is the last human face I want to see. The little head watched our watching, maliciously inscrutable. And suddenly I realized what I disliked about it. It was above all a smile of dramatic irony of those who have privileged information. I looked up into Conscious's face and knew I was right. He wore the same smile. In April 1915, I returned home. My mother fainted when she saw me. She thought I was dead. The letter telling them I was missing, believed killed in action, was joyously torn up. And Lily... Ah, Lily. She now treated me like the lover I longed to be. But always my dreadful secret lay between us. My fortnight's supposed leave drew to its end. I told her the truth, and she wept. But I was not allowed to comfort her. I had deceived her. That was the unforgivable thing, not that I'd deserted. And she begged me to go back to war for my own sake. But you didn't. A decision was made to ship me out of England to family friends in the Argentine. I said goodbye to her under a street lamp by a garden full of lilac trees. Two white faces, the scent of lilac, and unfathomable sadness. Four days later, I spent a disagreeable twelve hours crouched in the bilges of a Greek cargo boat at Liverpool docks. And then we were safely at sea, and my English life was over. Did you ever see Lily again? She died of typhoid in the early hours of February the 19th, 1916. It is all long past. But the dead live. How? By love. For at least 20 minutes after I went to bed, there was no sound. Then suddenly I heard it. Music again, this time from downstairs, the harpsichord. But the thing that sent a shiver up my spine was the thin, haunting piping of a recorder. I went downstairs. The door to the music room was open. I heard the rustle of a dress, and a slim girl in her early twenties was suddenly standing in the doorway. Her hair, her dress, everything about her belonged to the era of 40 years before. It was unmistakably Lily, the girl in the photograph. She saw me at once, and for a moment seemed as surprised as I was. And she smiled a strange smile, as though she was sharing a secret, then closed the door in my face. The whole exchange can't have taken more than five seconds. I crept back to my room, feeling as if the world had suddenly been reinvented for me alone. One thing at least was clear to me. I had to know the owner of that intelligent, amused, dazzlingly pretty face. Dear Nico, I've been trying to decide whether I want to see you again. The point is, I could. I come through Athens now. I know it's crazy, but I can't forget you, even when I'm with much nicer boys than you'll ever be. So I'll send a telegram if I can work a few days off at Athens. Please come. Alison. Alison's letter came at the worst time. One doesn't fall in love in a few seconds, but a few seconds can set one dreaming of it. The more I thought of Lily's midnight face, the more intelligent and charming it became. But my libido, neglected for so long, now rose strong, and I began to think of the dirty weekend pleasures of having Alison in some Athens hotel bedroom. In the end, I replied to her that the weekend after next was half-term, and I might just be in Athens then. The letter sent, I found Melly and soaked him for information about Conscious. 
I cannot believe it. Conscious keeps so much to himself. He is not popular in the village. Because he collaborated with the Nazis? No, no. That is a lie. Oh. In the war, the Germans made Conscious mayor. One day they captured a resistance fighter from the mainland and ordered Conscious to execute him. He refused and was put before a firing squad. By a miracle, his life was saved. But many in the village lost husbands and sons in the German reprisal. In their opinion, Conscious should have done as he was ordered. He's invited me over again this weekend. If I do two preps for you, will you do my Sunday? And don't tell anyone. I am as silent as the... Uh, what is it? The, the coffin. <laughs> the grave, Melly, the grave, where you bloody well belong. You play beautifully, Mr. Conscious. You make words seem like shabby things. Bach does that. But thank you. I'm flattered. It's me who should thank you. I feel very privileged to be included in the world of Barani. And on that subject, I can't help noticing that there are three chairs set out on the terrace. We shall have a visitor after dinner. You know who it will be. I didn't know if I was meant to come downstairs last week or not. You are meant to do as you choose. <laughs> you must treat our guest as you would an amnesiac. She lives in the present. She has no past. She is very sensitive. I promise I won't spoil the game. If I don't understand why, I'm beginning to understand how. The opposite, my young friend. You are beginning to understand why, not how. Lily was dressed in the formal evening style of 1915. An indigo silk evening wrap over a slim, ivory-coloured dress of some shot material that narrowed and ended just above her ankles. Lily, may I present Mr Nicholas Earth, Miss Lily Montgomery. Mr Earth and I met last week. Well, that is, we caught a glimpse of each other. I gather you are a school teacher. That must be a very interesting profession. I find it rather dull, but I forgive teaching since it's brought me here tonight to meet you, Miss Montgomery. You're very gallant, Mr. Earth. Nicholas, this is not the real Lily. Neither is she anyone impersonating the real Lily. I'm sorry, I don't know what you're telling me. Not to jump to conclusions. This Lily always does exactly what I want. I looked at Lily. She gave me what was beyond any doubt a contemporary look. A quick questioning glance that flicked from me to Conscious's averted head and back again. At once I had the impression that we were two actors with the same doubts about the director. I will fetch us some brandy. Have you been here long, Miss Montgomery? I have not been anywhere long. You do this very charmingly, but what exactly is the game? Would you show me? Please, it's grown rather chilly. Thank you. Where do you live? I've been all over Barani. I've never seen your house. Or well, perhaps you have the wrong kind of vision. I have the feeling I'm being teased, which I must tell you I hate. And I shall continue to do it. I should warn you, we all love Morris very much. His other visitors and myself. Visitor seems an odd way of putting it. Morris does not like the word ghost. How does he feel about actress? We are all actors and actresses, Mr. Earth. Be patient. You will understand. Is that a promise? A prediction. The next morning I had breakfast alone, then went swimming. When I paused and looked back towards the beach, she was standing there wearing an exquisitely pretty First World War summer dress. I swam in as fast as I could, and as I waded through the shallow water, I found myself speechless in appreciation. The clothes, the setting, her ravishing beauty. The wind teased her long, silky blonde hair across her mouth, and as she brushed it away, I noticed for the first time a vivid scar above her left wrist. You look beautiful, like a Renoir. That is very forward of you, Mr. Earth. <coughs> but as a reward for your gallantry, I will read your palm. Now, let me see. You will have a long life and three children. 
You are stronger in mind than in heart. Your finger feels wonderful on my skin. Pray do not interrupt. Sometimes you betray your true self, and sometimes you betray those who love you. You will make love to many girls, but will be truly happy with only one. Her you will marry and be happy with for the rest of your life. <laughs> Fascinating. Now, can I read yours? Can is not may. But I will allow it in the name of science. I see only one thing clearly in your hand. A lot more intelligence than you're showing at the moment. Nicholas, be careful. Everything we say, he hears. <sighs> he knows. Look, are you his mistress? What do you take me for? I just want to know where I stand. No, I am not his mistress. And that is a very impertinent remark. Shall we walk towards the jetty? All right, if that's what it says in the script. Nicholas, Nicholas, Nicholas. The bell tolls for you. You must obey its summons. Fine. But before I go, can I, may I, have tangible proof we're friends again? Mr. Earth, are you asking me to commit osculation? <laughs> Spot on. But you're not a real Edwardian girl, and we both know it. Wait for me. I'll be as quick as I can. I clambered up the path and started towards the house, but I had barely taken two steps across the gravel when the world split in half. A figure appeared on the terrace above me. It was Lily. It couldn't be her, but it was her. The same hair blew about in the wind, the dress, the figure, the face, everything. She was staring out to sea, totally ignoring me. It was a wild, dislocating shock, yet I knew within seconds that this was not the same girl as the one on the beach, but was so like her, it could only mean one thing. A twin sister. There were two lilies in the field. Once I got to the house, the terrace, as I half expected, was empty, but there was a radiogram waiting for me on the table. Back in Athens next Friday. Stop. Three days free. Stop. Airport six evening. Stop. Please come. Alison. It was like grit in the eye just when one wants to see clearly. I read the wretched thing again, all the while thinking of Lily and her twin. But slowly I came to realise that if Conscious invited me for half term, I could easily cancel Alison, and if he didn't, I would have her to fall back on. Feeling I had come to an answer that gave me the best of both worlds, I lay on my back under my favourite tree and closed my eyes. But I was given little time to doze. Be not afeard. The isle is full of noises, sounds and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will hum about mine ears, and sometimes voices that, if I then had waked after long sleep, will make me sleep again. I opened my eyes. A fiendish green and black face with protuberant fire-red eyes glared down at me. A Chinese carnival mask on a stick. I am Astarte, mother of mystery. Sorry, I'm an atheist. Well, then I shall have to teach you faith. I saw your twin sister, by the way. I have no idea to what you are referring. Put down that silly mask and start talking sense. Look, let me meet you somewhere away from here. Next weekend, perhaps? I see Prospero has been reading my mail. I don't find that amusing at all. I'm not going to Athens. That's all over. You no longer love this young woman? It wasn't that kind of relationship. You live together as man and wife? If you insist on putting it in that absurd way. Look, I didn't love her. It's just that until now, she's been the only person who's mattered. I wish you'd stop play-acting. I know you're not Lily Montgomery, even if she ever existed in the first place. She did exist. I know that because I exist. Oh, for God's sake! <laughs> <laughs> This whole setup is fantastic, I admit that. But please, when it's just you and me, let's stop flogging a dead horse. Okay? Let go of me, please. You're killing my back. Oh, give me a cigarette, will you? I'm gasping. That's better.
You have no idea how beautifully strange this experience has been. But please, tell me what's going on. What you said before, there is a kind of script. I meant to show you something now. A statue. She led me through the pines to a small natural amphitheater facing the sea. On a pedestal of unshaped rock stood a statue, a copy of the famous Poseidon fished out of the sea near Eubea. It's magnificent. It must have cost a small fortune. Just how rich is conscious? Beyond calculation. Will you at least tell me your real name now? No one can overhear us. Julie. Julie Holmes. No relation to Sherlock. And your twin sister? June. Please don't let one you know. How long have you known Conscious? A few weeks. We answered an advert for an acting role. It was well paid. Too well. I suppose that should have made us suspicious. But we're not doing anything against our will. It's like a game of blind man's buff, isn't it? <sighs> Being spun so much, you lose all sense of direction. Be honest, Nick. Would you like it if this was all called off now? No, I wouldn't. Has he threatened to do that? He doesn't have to. If we don't play the game his way, it's over. I know he can be maddening, absurd even. Mm -hmm. But I honestly think he's discovered a clue to something. You mean that psychic stuff? Travel to other worlds? I promise you, it really is the most amazing experience. You simply must let him try it on you. Oh, try what, there? You'll see. He surely can't expect me to carry on swallowing the lily thing. No, that's over. But if I know Morris, an hour from now, you won't know whether to believe a word I've said. <sighs> We really are all flies in his web. Telling the truth has been such a relief. I'm glad you forced it on me. I'd like to kiss you. We're being watched. I don't care. But one thing. If I ever find you aligned to me, I won't go on. I'll go. Quickly. He's waiting. Nicholas, you have been with Lily? I think you know I have. Nothing has struck you about her? Surely you've noticed the obsessive need to assume disguises, to give herself false motivations? I thought that was rather required of her. You mean her schizophrenia produces these symptoms? Every day I spend here, I feel my leg getting a little longer. You're telling me Julie is mad? No, this is my fault. I was so sure you had understood. But Rani is the one place the poor child can indulge her fantasies. I gave her the role of my long-dead fiancé. It is quite harmless and she enjoys playing it. It is in some of her other roles she is not quite so innocent. Other roles? One of the defining characteristics of schizophrenia is the formation of elaborate and systematic delusions. Lily has created a world that is entirely truthful to her, and she lives inside it. Here, for a month or two every year, we all conform to her needs. It's a relief from the private Swiss clinic where she spends the rest of her unhappy life. I feel like a ball that's being tossed between you both. Just now, Julie told me... Is that her real name, by the way? Julie Holmes, yes. Her case is virtually unique in there being a twin sister of a perfectly normal psychological type who could provide what we psychiatrists call a control. June adores her sister and will do anything for her. And you claim to be Julie's psychiatrist? Yes, but I have another more personal interest. She's not only my patient, but my godchild. Just before you told me all this, I was about to congratulate you on hiring such a skilled young actress. <laughs> she did not by any chance suggest that to you herself? No. Well, in a way, perhaps. What if she did? She has already adopted a new role towards you. That of an actress playing a part. In a way, it is true. She is a skilled actress. It is a feature of schizophrenia. One thing you should know... Although Lily might appear entirely free to wander, in reality her nurse never leaves her. He's very discreet, keeps himself well in the background. I don't know what to think. You shouldn't have offered me that poison tooth. <laughs> you don't trust me. It is understandable. 
but I must give you an important warning. One of the tragedies of Julie's condition is that she is a normally sexed young woman. Mm. She needs someone on whom to exercise her physical charms. Has she already achieved some success in that way with you? You know she has. No, well, you're not to blame. But for obvious reasons, if some situation should arise where you found temptation too strong, I should be obliged to intervene. I must stress that I did not anticipate this. Well, I was under the impression you had an emotional attachment elsewhere. If you're talking about the radiogram from Alison, which was my private business, by the way, I'm not going to Athens. Hmm. I would regret it very much if your decision was coloured by anything that is happening here. Perhaps you should know I have decided to take Julie away to rest for ten days. And while we're gone, why not enjoy a weekend in Athens? In fact, why not bring this girl, Alison, to Fraxos? You can stay in my house in the village. It's primitive, but quite comfortable. Thanks. But I really don't want to be involved with Alison anymore. I see. Well, forgive me. I will interfere no further, except to say this. Go to Athens, my friend. <sighs> Thank you. This is fantastic stuff. <laughs> it is Rocky from Kios. Very strong. I want to make you more receptive. Now, shall we begin our experiment? <clears throat> Clear your mind. Julie will not appear tonight. I want you to look at a certain star. Do you know Cygnus the Swan? that cross-shaped constellation directly above our heads. You're going to hypnotize me. I warn you, I'm not a good subject. Someone tried at Oxford. It is a harmony of wills, not a contest. Relax. Uh -huh. Now, do you see the swan? Uh -huh. To the left of it, you will find the very bright star known as Alpha Lyrae. Watch it closely. Relax all your muscles. Watch the star. You are tired. So you are relaxing. You're watching the star, that gentle star. White star. Yes, you are relaxing. One moment I was fully awake, and the next I was consumed by a strange illusion that I was not looking up at the star any longer, but down into space, as one looks down a well. I was watching the star, and the star was watching me. Then there came a wind on my face, and I realized that it was blowing on me from all directions at the same time. And then the wind became light, and this light was intensely pleasing, a mental sunbathing after a long, dark winter. I was having feelings that no language can describe. There was no meaning, only being. Then slowly I saw the star again, as it simply was, hanging in the sky above. <laughs> it was like walking through a door, going all around the world, then walking through the same door, but a different door. Then darkness. As I walked back to the school the next day, I tried to assess the experience. Why, though it was so beautiful, it also seemed so sinister. I saw how it had been done. There would have been some drug, some hallucinogen in the racky. I had a black plunge of shame and humiliation, of having been naked in front of conscious, of having been in his power. And in a more subtle yet similar way, I knew I had been equally hypnotized by Julie. I'd been enchanted into wanting sex before, but never into wanting love. I was bewitched and made no pretense of denying it. When Thursday night finally came and the school broke for half term, I hurried over to Barani again. But it was deserted, just as Conscious had said it would be. I had the uneasy sense that I was no longer sure the schizophrenia was a lie. From faintly possible, it had grown probable. Why else had Conscious halted the mask so abruptly? 
And as I roamed the grounds, I thought of Conscious's arrogance and foolishness in leaving his priceless portraits in an empty house. And from those lush Bonnard paintings so full of life and sexuality, my mind leapt like a grasshopper to a memory of Alison. Naked, her hair in a towel, wholly unaware of her sensual nature, yet somehow innocent too. I knew there was a midnight ferry. It meant sitting up all night in the scruffy saloon, but it gave me the Friday in Athens. A moment later I was walking fast back down the path to the gate, and even then at the last moment I looked back towards the house and hoped against hope that someone might be beckoning to me. But there was no one there. And so, for want of any better plan, I embarked for Athens. And Alison. In episode one of The Magus, Nick was played by Tom Burke and Conscious by Charles Dance, Lily by Hayley Atwell and Alison by Anna Skellen. Margaret was played by Josie Taylor, Midford by David Seddon, Melly by Chris Pavlo and Rowena by Lindsay Ann Moffat. The harpsichord was played by Maggie Cole and the recorder by Martin Feinstein. The Magus was written by John Fowles and adapted by Adrian Hodges. The producer was Heather Lama. Thank you.